consequence of some intervention that happened? We don't know the answer to that. Jury is still out on that. But the reason I'm telling you all this is we are at a point in time, like some super species gave us intelligence or language, or we are at a time in the, in the evolution of human history that we ourselves are creating subspecies to which we can tell things like, create me a selfie picture of Abraham Lincoln with his friends, and it generates this beautiful picture, right? So if you think about it, machines are just metal, bare metal. So we ourselves are creating some sort of a little bit of intelligence into these machines. So that is the goal of today's lecture and the whole lecture series. How are we learning this intelligence? How are we going towards deep learning or understanding, understanding everything? So this is a moment what you know people have been calling the singularity moment when we are actually going and creating that moment on, in time, like what happened to humanity 100,000 years ago, we are creating a subspecies which is able to understand language. So how does this happen? So this happens because of this field called natural language processing, along with other things, of course, and we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. So natural language processing is a field where we are simply doing exactly what I said, understanding human language and trying to teach that to bare metal machines. So during which we use tools like deep learning. And this is what we are going to learn about today and in this series. So let's find out how does deep learning work? So to understand that, you need to understand this concept called neural networks. And neural networks essentially are a connection of connections of neurons. And of course, we call it artificial new neural networks because the original neural networks is inside your head. It's the connect connection, connection of neurons inside our human brain. So what we have been doing is we are trying to emulate that, albeit in a very, very small way. Like if you think, you know, a machine creating a selfie of Abraham Lincoln is cool. That's only one by hundred of apparently the number of neurons, like the current set of neurons in a, in a model like GPT is only one by hundred of what human brain has. So imagine what, what abilities human brain has and how we can go towards it. So, so much for the theory. Let's get into the details of what is going on. Oh, to that, another trivia question. So where do you see this sign almost on a daily basis? Have you seen this? Like you probably have seen this. Yeah, okay, you said that in your car. So this is essentially your cruise control in the cars, right? So the reason I'm saying this is, how does cruise control work? So if you think about it, it's a constant feedback mechanism between expected speed and the current speed, right? So we set the speed to let's say 41 miles per hour, kilometers per hour in this case. And you know, the, say the car is going at 50 and you send the command, oh, I want 41. So the car is gonna keep changing the speed little by little and come down, it's gonna check at every second. Oh, it is this speed. Oh, I came from 50 to 49. Okay, no, it's not 41 yet. Okay, let me keep going down. So there is this constant feedback mechanism between expected speed and current speed. So that is exactly how deep learning works. So in the neural network, the only difference is we call it back propagation. So it's a constant feedback mechanism between the expected value and the current value. Say for example, when we are, you would have seen you know, classifiers or machine learning algorithms which create, which identify dog. So the way it does is when you give it a ton of images, it first says, when, you, when we are training it, it says, oh, maybe this is a cat. Then it looks at, the, looks at the expected value, oh, not a dog. So let me take the feedback mechanism, go backwards, and let me understand what is a dog. So that is the basic, very really high level idea of how a neural network or a deep learning works. So this is a little bit more details. There are a couple of different layers which you typically have in a neural network. The first layer is what we call input layer. So remember I was telling you about the picture of cat and picture of dog. So the way we do it is we take the picture of cat, picture of dog. Right now, for example, you know, things like uh, GPT, the way it works is on one side, it takes the picture of dog and cat. 
And on the other side, it takes the word dog and cat, understands it together, puts them together in something what we know as embeddings. And then it's just, it's just numbers at that point, just vectors. And those vectors go through this bunch of neurons, really just you know deep connected neurons created out of software uh, components. And it's just trying to emulate the human brain. And all it does is takes that knowledge sends it out into the output layer. And it says, oh, let me predict if it's a cat or a dog from whatever I learned. And we have a gold label, which is essentially saying, oh, in reality, it's a dog. So then it just back propagates into this whole feedback loop. And this goes on for millions of cycle. And it keeps doing that until it finds a nice understanding pattern. So here, the only difference is, so this technology, you know, this was invented in the 1960s. And the only reason this is becoming so famous in the last one decade is the advancement in technology. Like we now have a lot of hardware, which is able to do this huge amount of learning and back propagation. And the way the current large language models work is instead of having one input like cat or dog, all it does is let's take the entire internet and just dump it straight onto this huge mechanism known as, let's say, GPT, right? It's a huge collection of all these uh, bunch of neurons put together. And there's an entire, you know, people have entire life and career spent on what is the best way of connecting the neurons so that it understands the knowledge. But once it does that, ta-da, you have a large language model. So this is like a very eagle eye view of what or how a deep learning works. So sure, we are gonna get into all those, you know, my, uh, deeper trenches kind of details. Uh, so the whole idea, like I said, is to discover hidden patterns in data. So if you think about it, a lot of things in the world, this is almost like we are being gener we are generating Sorry, there was somebody at the door. I was trying to let them in. Yeah, so if you think about it, a lot of these things in life, there are so many hidden patterns. We maybe subconsciously understand it, but not so much consciously. And that is exactly what we are trying to arrive at with deep learning. Like what are these hidden patterns? Can we like cluster them together? Can we learn anything from this? And there are all these amazing uh, discoveries people have done recently finding these hidden patterns. Sure, okay, so a couple of terms you might be familiar with, or if you haven't, doesn't matter. There are a lot, lot of these types of different deep learning models. So the ones we saw earlier was, they, are, they all come from something known as generative AI models. And the idea is we give, so the machine has gone through this feedback loop for like millions and trillions of times. It has learned something, and there's a big star and a caveat for some there because we still don't know what the machine is learning. We have a rough idea what it's learning, but that is like the sad truth of large language models. Different discussion, but it has learned something so much at least that when you tell it to create a selfie of Abraham Lincoln, it understands what selfie is. It understands what Abraham, who Abraham Lincoln is and his friends are and creates a selfie. So it is learning something, surely, it's going very close to human intelligence. But all this started like almost 10 years ago now from a fundamental neural network model known as transformers, nothing to do with the movies, but that's the name they chose at that time. And those transformers were com composed of something known as BERT. So a lot of little pieces, just I'm throwing names at you guys. You don't need to know this. The only reason I need, I'm telling you all this is again, why should you care? And the reason I'm telling you all this is there are so many of these amazing tasks people are able to do right now. For example, we call it computer vision. Like given a picture, how do I understand whether it's cat, grass, tree, sky, dog? So machines are now able to completely understand segments and part of a given picture, or at least tell you what it is. The word understand is a little complicated in this context. Uh, we still don't know if they're really understanding anything, but at least they are able to do things 
what we ask it to do, pretty much like training a dog. Um, so is it close to human intelligence? Different discussion. But this is big. Like, for example, if you have a, you know, if you are looking at the pictures from Mars rover, and now we don't need humans to sit and identify it. We can have a machine learning algorithm do that for you. So those, that's, that's one side of things, you know, what we call computer vision. The other side, which is actually, like I said earlier, the natural language processing, which is what we call text-based tasks. Here's an example. If you have a sentence, my experience so far has been fantastic. Sure, that's like a review somebody wrote and human, when we read it, we know it's positive review as opposed to like a negative one, which is your support team is useless. So right now there are AI algorithms which easily can just tell you, even chat GPT can tell you what the sentiment analysis is. Shouldn't use the word even, but one of the minimal tasks chat GPT could do is uh, tell you the sentiment of things or text classification. So this is very useful in, let's say, you know, if you have a spam email coming in and we classify it, that's like one of the very minimal ut utilities of it. This of course can be used in any of your research and your real life data sets. One, another big thing is machine translation. So we are able to have, you know, in all of your series and Google translates are sitting on top of these deep learning models, which have learned which is the best way to translate things. But hey, is it all useful in real life? Like, great, there's so much fancy stuff happening, but how is it really useful? Here's an example. This is an article which came recently, which says large language models in healthcare, like 10 major use cases. So here are a bunch of it, like understanding medical transcription, automated patient communication, things like that. But there's one thing which actually interested me understanding medical transcription or doctor notes. I mean, I'm not even talking about the you know doctors having good handwriting and stuff. Even when doctors like, if you, when you go visit a doctor at the end of every visit, the doctor has to make a note of what happened and why did you come up, come to the doctor? And the way he's gonna write, is it in plain English? He's just gonna take human natural language, like, hey, this patient had high blood pressure and he has a huge paragraph. Now. That is plain natural language. How do you tell an AI what it is, right? How does it mean? How do you how do you make sense out of it? And this is a big field in itself. Like people are making millions of money because right now we have AI models which completely understands what a doctor wrote about the patient and goes to five, which is automated patient communication. So when the patient calls in next time, the AI replies back saying, hey, welcome, we met you last week. And this is very helpful, especially if you, you know, you have something going on, you cannot get, you want to meet a doctor, but really there is no appointment available until, you know, end of your lifetime before end of your lifetime. So now we meet a telehealth and you tell the telehealth assistant, okay, again, an AI agent, and the agent is going, going through your community, uh, through your symptoms and will tell you, oh yeah, you really need to go to urgent care. You really need to go to emergency room and things like that. So everything, everything here is very, very realistic. So coming back to the main reason why you guys are here, so much for the spiel and the shameless plug, but how accessible are these AI models? Like it's really useless for if they are just sitting out there, we cannot learn anything about them except use them like chat GPT, right? The short answer is right now, as of today and now, it's right on your fingertips. And that's what we are gonna learn today. Again, welcome to the talk today on introduction to Hugging Face. Apart from being an amazing emoji, Hugging Face is an amazing company, corporate, or a collection of conglomerates, uh, whatever it is, but it has brought all these AI models straight into your fingertips. So if you go to https huggingface.co or you can just Google it hugging face, it'll have all the great, all of these models, including GPT is just right there accessible. So yes, let's get our hands dirty. Uh, if you guys have a laptop, can you go to this link here? So this is github.com slash UA data lab. I'm gonna try opening it in my own machine here.
bring that up. Um, so in that, if you can click on repositories, go to DL Deep Learning Workshops and get into workshop one. Uh, please speak up if you cannot access it, like cannot see the chats. Um, I'm sorry. Can I see the website? Is that for the same thing? Yes. Oh, so perfect, perfect. Beautiful. Um, okay, which one did you want the code? The, the one behind. The, yeah, we can just move that window down. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, same thing. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just same thing, just UA dash data lab. So if you are here, just click on repositories, deep learning workshops, and workshop one into intro to hugging phase. And if you can open intro to hugging phase dot Python notebook. Okay, once you open that, can you click on open in Colab? I'm assuming all of you have a Google account and if you have a Google account, this should happen to you, right? Okay, so let's, create a new one, let's call it a new notebook, right? You can maybe want to have two different windows. So the first thing I want you guys to do is, I'm, I'm just gonna go step by step. So this is the first line. Can you paste it in your new window? And all you have to do is press play or play button there. So like I said, this is why I introduced the word transformers because this is the fundamental, um, thing that sits behind all deep learning models these days. So this should happen to you. It should start installing it. And Colab, if you don't know, is an amazing web interface provided by Google. In fact, if you look at it, there's so many of these options. Like if you change the runtime type, you can access T4 GPUs and TPUs and all those big things, and it's for free. So which is why I was saying everything is on your fingertips. Okay, so once we do that, and if it says successfully installed, click on code again, go back to the other line, copy this line. So remember we are talking about hugging face, but do you already install hugging face by doing pip install transformers? And do this again, paste say from transformers import pipeline. And let it do its thing. Okay, cool, it did its thing. All right, so next two lines. So here I'll just explain this. So pipeline is something people at Hugging Face put together saying, hey, we have a little, little pipeline and all we need, we have trained the machine learning model for sentiment analysis in this case. And with, this is just like any of the initializations in Python, which we do like just, hey, let's create an object of this guy. Um, let's see, I'm gonna paste this guy here. And I'm maybe even I just start a new code line. It's more in, interesting if I keep it decentralized. Okay, so it should immediately just say, okay, starts working, good. It's gonna download the standard model. So if you look at the model, this has this little BERT in it, like the word BERT I had introduced earlier. So it's already connecting to a well-established trained model, like an AI model, and it is ready to do sentiment analysis for you. So I did this earlier and I'm gonna paste it again. And the same line, you can either copy paste or type it yourself. And all you have to do is classifier. Tell me what is the sentiment of I love deep learning. Oh, it says, okay, positive. It's very positive. And I'm 99.99% sure that it's positive. Right. So let's do I hate deep learning. I hope you don't. Because I'm hoping you're here, not visiting. So it says, hey, I'm still confident. I like it's a negative. So let's try this. I might like deep learning. So let's see what it says. It says positive. It's 99%. Okay. It's still is okay with that. Uh, not positive or negative that I like deep learning. I'm just messing with it. Um, you can try it yourself, okay. It still thinks it's positive, but anyway, you get the idea. So these are trained models. Now, if you go to hugging face slash models, 
you can actually it's like a huge spectrum of any of the models you want. Like if you look at the left side, we are only dealing with one small subset. In fact, now in here, um, I think the sentiment analysis is too below their pay grade that they don't even mention it. There are like amazing things like summarization and sentence similarity. But look around, see this. Um, there is computer vision, all the pictures you wanted to do ever, like identify the depth, image classification. And then there is multi-model, which is, this is this is exactly the uh, Abraham Lincoln thing, like, you know, image to text and text to image and text to video, right? And only thing you have to do is go back to your pipeline. So let's try another thing like text generations, right? So I'm going to see. We can read about this in their in their documentation and pipeline. So just see all this is like I'm just introducing you to it today. Literally, it's an introduction to Hugging Face class. And all I'm going to do is hey, here's a generator, right? And I'm going to say pipeline text generation. So it goes to actually in this case for text generation, the default model is GPT, which is rare because GPT two was less than a year old at this point, maybe two, and anything more than two, you have to pay for it. But this is right there for you. It's just free. Um, and hey, so I wrote this sentence earlier, which is Tucson, Arizona is known for something. And I asked the generator, what is it known for? It does its own thing. And it's known for being a tough football facility. So we came up with a list of top recruiting classes. Don't want to comment on this. That's an open can of worms. Uh, we use the top 10 rank school on the list. But again, this is GPT telling you stuff. And this is going back to my initial comment on is are these models really learning anything or it's like adding things which it's just seen before because this sentence makes no sense, es especially if you try generating it again. I want to see if it does the same thing again. Uh, oh, it's known for making roots appear small. Great. Amazing. I just have no idea what it said. Uh, there were also maintenance army troops for World War II, and they're on the rise. Okay, so this is gibberish, but welcome to the AI, right? So it's telling you something, and you can argue GPT-2 is not as strong as GPT-4, which is powering chat GPT, et cetera, et cetera. My point there is all this at this point is right there on your fingertips, right? So, you know, you can go around looking at this, like there's pipeline question answering, try the same thing there. Um, at this point, this is you can you guys can do it on your own. So my goal here is introducing you to hugging face. Just this, there's an amazing thing called hugging face, right? And you can play around with it. And next week onwards, we'll go deeper into this. Um, like I said, you can summarization. You give it a big paragraph. Do oh caveat: do not use this on your homeworks. Or you can if nobody can catch you with that. But sure, <laughs> but. Yeah, at this point, there was this recent news article where, you know, there was a paper published in Nature, except somebody found out that the paper had one line regenerate response. So the big, well-known paper in the big news, in the big paper, big, you know, rank one research paper, research journal in the world, papers published, and there was one line regenerate response, which if you remember, is what chat GPT says. When you ask it a question, hey, write me a paragraph on American dramatically change. It apparently somebody just wrote the whole damn paper using Chat GPT and forgot to remove the regenerate response when it was copy pasting. And this is so I'm teaching you all the dark arts, but don't use it at your own risk. Uh, Okay. Okay. So some somebody just told me that apparently Amazon now has um, a rule that the same person should not publish more than three books a day. Which clearly the only way you can do three books a day is you are probably using exactly these three lines, which is where the generate text generation. Write me a book for something. Um, so yeah, I can keep going. Summarization and all those examples. There's even for translation. You know, fill the mask. What you know. This course will teach you about blank. Uh, yeah, so that is the introduction. So if you want, you can play around with, let's say, uh, I don't I don't even know if I played with text image. Um, but this is all like easy at this point. You can just go to same pipeline, look at what people have done on this. Oh, 
one question you might have is how do you find a good model? Uh, usually the best way is most downloads, like for anything, let's say text classification, right? So most downloads. So apparently like, you know, this is 12.7 million people have downloaded this and text classification, this particular model known as Distilbert works well. Let's see what GPTs do here. Okay. So yeah, you can find a lot of GPTs also in there. A lot of llamas there. Llama is uh, the meta one. So this is the best. This is the way you can access these models from command line. So now the question is great, but these are trained models, right? What do we do with trained models? Like, remember, like I said, all these models was trained on everything under the sun, or in this case, everything on the internet. And which is why it's most of the time just hallucinating and telling you random stuff. But things get, get more interesting when you yourself can train it on one of your subtasks, which is, let's say you are a you know graduate student or a PhD student working on a rare disease and you have a bunch of data sets on rare diseases. So how can you train your model and not just rely on everything under the internet, right? So those are, that's how, that, that is everything we are gonna capture in this particular uh, talk or the series of it. Uh, so let me show you a little bit of the plan for the rest of the series. Uh, if I can bring that up while you can play with uh, hacking face. Da, 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 da. Okay, so this is the rough outline of what I planned for. The first is like intro to hugging face, this, sh this should be here, but I'm gonna teach you how to use this like transformers and train it like using these models next class. This is all gonna move up. Um, and then remember I was telling you how to train and the one I was telling you about rare diseases is fine tuning. It's known as fine tuning a pre-trained model. And then, so essentially you're saying this model is already trained on the internet data, but I'm gonna make it, so it probably never saw all the rare disease data because it's rare and you are the only one who has that data. So this is the, then what we do something known as fine tuning. Now there is a big question mark of, you know, why do these machine learning models need so much amount of data? It really needs like internet level data to learn something. Um, so there is all this research going on on how can we train the models only on the small, let's say you have 100 data points of rare diseases. You know, somebody's symptoms for rare diseases. So that's what we learn in training a model from scratch. Like, how can you start learning by training, like training it, train the whole model all by yourself? Then we'll actually go to something known as Databricks SageMaker. So SageMaker is essentially everything what you saw there, but in, in Hugging Face, but instead it runs on AWS, which is the Amazon Web Service. So remember I was telling you, Colab lets you do all this, you know, you can pick all the TPU, GPU and all, but you know, it's gonna hit, it's gonna come bite you pretty soon because as the size of your data increases, the free tiers are not gonna satisfy for, for the you know, amount of training you wanna do. So which is why I'll introduce you to the Amazon Web Service and a uh, lot of it is pretty free and you can start running code in there. And also you, I would, point you guys to something we have developed in, in University of Arizona, known as Cybers. So this is a very huge beast in itself. It, it's pretty much similar to your high performance computing, but way beyond that, it has like AWS, but a lot of, you know, click and play kind of things. So we'll see, we'll go through all this in terms of how we can train the language models um, and things like that. Okay, so let's see if I have anything else now. Intro to hugging face. So I'm probably gonna just skip all this. You guys can. I, this is all shared on the on the UA Dash Data Lab GitHub uh, page. You saw. You can try playing it yourself. Playing with it yourself. Okay. Thank you, English. Uh, let's see. So you got this. Um, 
Where's my UA data lab? And the DL workshops, it's all here. I'll upload this there. And also, oh, we have a wiki page, which is where if you, you know, you don't remember where, what you learned today, just all the slides are gonna be here, linked to Jupyter notebooks. And if I'm, if you're not familiar with GitHub, just play around with it a little bit. Um, what else? Yes, a lot of these answers is right there in data science at Arizona.edu. And the reason we are doing all these workshops is we are going towards this. Like, like we, as a data science institute, we are planning to be like a stop, one-stop shop for anything data related, deep learning and things like that. We do consultations for departments uh, or you can like, you can find all the contacts on data science.arizona.edu or you can drop me an email. At this point, I'll open the floor for questions. We still have like 10 minutes left. You have any questions here so, or online? Yeah, go ahead. When, when you're talking about the beginning of the slide, how like it so takes the input and then it does a lot of processes, goes back to, and it just goes bounces back and forth back and forth. Time. Mm -hmm. And what is like the condition where it stops bouncing back and forth? Yeah, so this is a that's a very good question. And the question for people online is the question from the class was, you know, this machine is the machine learning neural network is gonna go back and forth multiple times. When do we stop? And when do we know it has really learned something? Right? At the end of the day, we don't want it to memorize stuff. We really want it to learn so that tomorrow you give it a new question, it should be able to answer it. So the way we do this is we have something known as training data. What we are like, let's say 1 billion data on the internet, but while training, we also have something known as a hidden development set or test set. So the machine never trains on that little subset. So we are gonna keep checking with the subset. Okay, we, we have never seen any of this data. Say for example, let's, let's say a hypothetical example, it's learning everything about medicine, like uh, diseases, except this one rare disease, right? And we are, let's say, okay, here's you're learning all these symptoms from all these diseases, but we are never going to train you on this rare disease. But we are going to constantly, like after, you know, every thousand cycles, we are going to check that task. Like the task could be, hey, what is the symptoms for this rare disease? So we check with the, the hidden set, the hidden 100 data points, and we ask, oh, is this symptom what the machine predicted? Is that correct? So this is not just training alone, but we are constantly checking with the set which it has not seen during training. So, and that is the accuracy we are gonna keep monitoring. Once that accuracy comes to pretty good level, we stop. It's like, okay, it has learned something and it is able to predict things from an unknown data set. So that's like a very abstract level answer to your question, uh, but we will get into the deep things in the rest of the workshop. Go ahead. And so, when is so it's constantly creating extra, like not extra, new hidden layers with each round of data going through? No, no. So, the right now, the state of the art is these hidden layers, it's almost like your brain, your neurons and your connections are already there. What so the neurons are existing? What new is all these connections in between and the weights that it learns? Like, hey, when it learns a new input, this time it's a cat. All right, then the machine decides, oh, I don't wanna go from this line, the W1, I go into, into this one here, I'll send it here. So that is how human brain works. The human brain is the connections, the path it takes is different every time. It's like the, it's like the cruise control example I told you before. This is like, imagine this is just like one of a trillion or million of this combination, like speed. Okay, if you are looking at speed, I'm gonna take I'm learning speed, I'm gonna learn this path. Next it says, sees cat. Oh, it decides, okay, it's gonna take another path. So the to answer your question, if the hidden layers are the ones which are changing, no, the hidden layers are fixed, but it's the connection and the, and the weights, what we call weights, which assign to the connections and the, the paths, you know, the path, the millions and trillions of paths, which the machine wants to take next. So it's all in that, path and what weight it is learning. So essentially at the end of the day, if you ask, if you ask me what is one thing the machine is learning, 
just the weight of this path. This path is more important. Oh, this data should go here. Okay, this is better. I tried this, didn't work. Oh, the cat should go here. So, yeah, and the truth is nobody knows how it is doing it. It seems to be doing it well. Nobody's complaining. But this, we are literally dumping all the data into this big black box known as neural network. And it is doing this back and forth, back and forth. It does, it learns all these good paths. But if you turn back and ask it, like, why is this path better than the other? You don't have an answer. It, you just know the weights it finally learned. That is a sad truth. People are working on understanding what it is learning. It's a little Skynet moment if you know the Terminator story. Like, hey, there's a black box which is learning something. We are happy. It's working great. But we really don't know what it's learning. How is information that's learning. So we know what we find, we can see the weight lines, this path, that path, but what does that mean, mean in terms of cat, right? Why did you think this picture is cat and not a dog? So oh, what was it? It cannot tell you. It's because that is a human connection. Like that's the language which we are asking it. Yeah, but in this picture, what made you think it is cat? It's going to tell, no, no, this line, that line, that line, this line. Okay, what is, what is there in the that? picture that is a cat? So there's a big, big discussion on is the machine learning really understanding something or is it just the weights? But like I said, nobody's complaining. A lot of great things are going on. So it's a little question mark. Do you want to really believe in a black box? But different discussion. One more question. Do you think they're, they're fixed, right? Like when in the past, are what's changing and it changes the path through all the different tests that we do. Do we design the fixed points that where it has to, or like how are those? Yeah, so the are... hidden layers, it's a big, the question is like who decides what is in the hidden layer or the fixed, how many neurons are there and how many, what is the architecture? Do you want 10 in the first layer, 20 in the other layer? People, the truth is trial and error. Right now, like all these big companies, Google's and OpenAI, they just have this huge amount of resources. They just try, let's say, take a million layer in the million neurons in the first layer, two trillion in the second, and let's train it and see what happens. Oh, it didn't work. So then they have this, what we call architectures, literally like mixing and matching all these architectures. And finally they say, oh, we should, there's a trial and error. This architecture looks good. We call it encoder, decoder. We'll get into it in, a, in the next class. But again, the same thing works. Nobody's complaining, but it's literally engineering at that point and not science. So it's a thin layer. You know, deep learning is a little, Shady, if you ask me, there's a lot of engineering and not understanding it works. I'll teach you how it works, why it works, but everything else is your conclusion. Uh, any other questions from in person or online? You have a comment? Sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the comment from the audience was essentially what it what the model does is it is learning the probability of next word. And this is the perfect example. Like, remember, we saw that example when we were trying to ask it to do something and it created some random, I, I cannot even find that. We said, you know, Tucson, what is Tucson known for? It just told you last time I saw the word Tucson, this there, it was right next to the word army. So I'm going to put the word army back to you and tell it back to you. So this is all like, it's a little shady, but for things that works, it works. So yeah, it, it's, literally, it's literally learning which word is next, right? It has seen what word is next. And is it really understanding with it? Like I said, don't know, jury is out on that. Yeah, sorry, I cannot see the Zoom chat. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna do it now. Um, okay, so there are the others. Uh, <laughs> okay, Tucson is known for marijuana, but which is question? I have a beginner question. When trying to use lines that generator equals pipeline text generation, I get the notice no model was supplies. Yeah, this seems to continue fine in Google Colab, but it doesn't seem to work when I do this in PyCharm. Um, okay, PyCharm is a different beast. I don't want to go into PyCharm at this point because Colab does a lot of these abstractions for you and um, it is calling it directly from Hugging Face. I suggest you stick to Colab. I can go try it on my PyCharm and let you know how that happens. 
uh, Colab is like a good starting place at this point. Um, I, other question is, I installed the ones from this lesson. Is there some specific needed library outside this lesson? Uh, we will get to it. I, at this point, I will tell you just play around with the libraries. And like I said, if you if you, if your question is what is a good library to use, just uh, pick the one which has more downloads. Like I said, you know the models which has more downloads. It's more like a peer review kind of thing. We you know you want to do this task. So sir, sort by most downloads, right? So um, we are gonna stick to natural language processing for a bit because one thing I need to mention at this point is all these models. So the history is that we had people working on computer vision, which is identifying images, audio, video, everything. But with this in the last five years, the natural language processing went so far ahead that all these other guys are now like relying on what is the meaning of cat as a text, right? So then they're mapping, oh, cat is a text. Let's learn, let's take whatever GPT has learned about cat in terms of the weights we talked about earlier and just create a new mapping. This picture of cat is connected to that picture of the knowledge of the meaning of cat. So, which is why most of our workshop will be focusing on the language part of it because the rest is actually easy. The rest is just that mapping between cat and the meaning of cat. But learning the meaning of cat in all these tasks is what we are gonna learn. Okay, I let me see if there's any other questions. Um, I turn my side. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there's any more questions there. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, all right, guys, thank you. Um, like I said, just visit all these websites and drop me an email if you, um, if I can find the link back up there. Okay, drop me an email um, or go to data science. Yeah. This will happen same day, same same place, same time next week.